Girls don't game. How many times have I heard that in my life? I was a teenager in the 1980s, a time of bad fashion and unfortunate hairstyles. <laughs> Luckily for me, there was no such thing as Facebook in those days, so photographs like this of me and my family are mercifully few and far between online. What is more well documented online is the fact that my love of technology came from my brother. Like so many women of my generation, it took a male influence in my life to spark a, a desire and a passion for science, technology, engineering and mathematics, otherwise known as the STEM subjects. It wasn't that I experienced any direct sense of oppression, it was more just a question of the fact that girls weren't expected to be into technology. It's just the way that it was. No questions asked. I went to an all-girls school where the closest I ever got to a computer was when I was invited to the headmistress's office to discuss my behaviour. They seemed determined to deliver me into the world with a, a, a finely honed set of domestic skills at my disposal. In our excellently appointed home economics laboratories, I learned how to bake a Swiss roll and embroider my name on an apron presumably in case I ever forgot who the apron belonged to. My brother, in contrast, went to a mixed comprehensive. He was two years older than me, and he got to study things like computer studies and technical drawing, although I'm reliably informed that he could have chosen cookery and needlework if he'd wanted to. The point was, though, he got the choice. It was a choice that wasn't given to me, as a teenager at school, I wasn't ever exposed to computers and technology. And it wasn't until I was 15 years old that I actually even realised what I was missing out on. As this clip of me and my family on a game show in 1979 will demonstrate. Let's talk about, about uh, the things you like to do. Uh, what kind of things do you do, like doing, Kate? I like doing modern dance and disco dancing. Do you do disco dancing? Yeah. Matthew, what, what, uh, what hobbies have you got? Uh, computers. Uh, like playing around with computers. Do you? Yes. Oh, yes. How many have you got? Seven? Eight? <laughs> <laughs> no, the school's got a microcomputer and a computer that's linked up with the Hatfield Polytechnic. I see. And which lessons do you use it for in school? Uh, well, we've just finished doing computer studies in third year. I see. And then we go on after school whenever we can. So it was my brother's love of technology that meant in the mid-1980s, our family became one of the really early adopters to get a computer at home, BBC Micro. It was wildly expensive for its time, but it was absolutely mind-blowing. It was like magic in a box. And in 1984, a game came out for the BBC Micro called Elite. And I became a gamer. I left school as soon as I could, I didn't get education, and by the mid-90s I'd worked my way up to being a computer games journalist. Now, the computer games industry in the mid-1990s to early 2000s, it was a ridiculous, crazy time. There was so much money, it was a real gold rush. People ploughing money into defining genres and coming up with new ways to express this great new cultural aspect, video gaming. And for me, really, I didn't really even realise at that point that I wasn't supposed to be into technology. It was a very, very male-dominated industry. And there were dozens and dozens and dozens of magazines popping up all over the place to try and kind of capture this new idea and exploit it to its full extent. It was a very sort of social industry. Everybody knew everybody in the computer games industry. And... I can count the number of fellow female games journalists that I knew on the fingers of one hand. And luckily for me, I grew up with two brothers in a competitive family, so I was able to handle the kind of verbal rough and tumble that seemed to be acceptable and came along with the job. Not that it ever stepped over the mark of decency, by the way, like some people seem to be thinking it's okay today in the name of a debate around gaming culture. The, the abuse and the sexism and the a violent aggression that's being expressed online at the moment towards women in gaming is absolutely abhorrent on every level. Um, 
But that's a debate for another day, and I couldn't possibly do it justice today, unfortunately. Um, but for me, in the mid-90s, the only real sense I got of sexism was that the guys I worked with pretty much expected to be able to beat me at any video game that they would play, because I was a girl, and girls don't play games, right? And in some cases, that was true. You know, I'll admit, I'm rubbish at football games, can't stand them, and so they would beat me. Give me an automatic rifle and something to aim at, however, and it was a different story entirely. So, over the next few years, I managed to gain some kind of a grudging respect from my peers. And it wasn't until a couple of years later, when I got a profile where people started wanting to interview me and ask me my opinion on stuff, that I realised that I was missing something pretty fundamental. Something so important, in fact, that pretty much everybody seemed to think that I should have it. Because suddenly, I started getting asked the same question over and over again. What's your female perspective on technology? My female perspective on technology. Does this seem like an odd question to me? Because up until the point people started asking me it, I had no idea I was supposed to have a different perspective from my male colleagues. I mean, why would I? Out of all of my life experience, all of the people that I've met and the things that I've seen, I'm supposed to define my perspective on something by my ability to birth a child. Now, I realize I'm oversimplifying that somewhat, but honestly, being a woman is such a small part of who I am that I think it's a bit of a, a red herring to hold it up as a defining characteristic. It's why so many products that have been designed to appeal to women in science and technology, they just don't work. It's like, it's like looking at your hands and saying, these thumbs are underrepresented. I shall make a pair of gloves just for thumbs. Of course, it's not going to work, because unless you make the glove for the whole hand, then it's not going to fit. And don't get me wrong, I am 100% behind any initiative, no matter how small, to try and get more women interested in working in STEM professions. But for me, I think if we really want to truly solve the gender imbalance in the UK workforce, indeed the global workforce, I think we need to go right back to basics and start getting really young girls truly, genuinely interested in science and technology. Because at the moment, they just don't seem to be. 46% of women make up the UK workforce right now, and yet only 15.5% of them work in STEM professions, and that number drops to just 8% when you look at engineering. The number of women working in the UK tech sector has fallen again this year from 17% to 16%, and that incidentally is a number that's been falling by about half a percent year on year for over a decade. Well, you might be forgiven for thinking it's about education, but girls outperform boys at GCSEs and A-levels, and there are more women graduating from university than men. And yet, just 12% of engineering and technology undergraduates are women. I don't get it. It completely baffles me. And not just because I personally love technology. I'm not alone. Women now make up more than half of the game-playing population in the, year, in, in the UK. And there's every indication to suggest that we are the major decision-makers when it comes to buying a piece of technology or a game for use at home. So I know I'm not alone in my love of technology. Women are behind around 65% of successful Kickstarter campaigns. And over at Indiegogo, female-led campaigns have consistently proved to outperform male-led campaigns. So we're not missing out on the entrepreneurial gene. Perhaps it's about education then, right? No. By 2020, 49% of women will have degree level qualifications, incidentally compared to just 44% of men. And women are anticipated to take two thirds of the new high skilled jobs over the next six years. So we can do education. So what is it that is stopping young girls from taking the option to study the STEM subjects? Well, interestingly, the founder of Rewired State, Emma Mulqueeny, had um, an experience a couple of years ago, which I think throws some possible light on the topic. 
they were trying to get more girls to sign up for their young rewired state hackathon weekends and so they ran a campaign saying there aren't enough girls doing this come and join us and what they found was by highlighting the lack of girls in these weekend sessions the sign-ups from females actually dropped from five percent to three percent Emma Mulqueenie said in an interview with the Guardian newspaper in 2012 it was because I shed light on it being a more male thing. And that's like social suicide. They think you'll only get really nerdy girls if it's boy dominated. In the end, incidentally, they uh, engaged Lily Cole, the actress and model, on the judging panel, and the sign-ups from females jumped up to 23%. But in my experience, and this kind of supports what, I, what my experience is, in speaking to students at education events and schools where I'm invited to go and speak about STEM careers, young girls, 14, 15, they don't want to stick out for being different. You know, being a teenager is really awkward. When you're dealing with raging hormones and zits and boys and your first period and all that yucky stuff that you have to deal with. The last thing you want to do is stick your head above the parapet and stand out for something which could make you a target. There's also, for girls and women, a, an additional problem to deal with, something called stereotype threat. Research has shown that when you put females in an environment where they're massively outnumbered, or indeed where societal expectations because of deep ingrained gender bias are that they're not going to do as well, science, maths, engineering, then the pressure they put on themselves not to conform to the negative stereotype perception is so great that it actually causes them to underperform and screw up. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We literally cannot win unless we start changing the way that we think. And that includes us as well. We need to change the way we think about ourselves and the way that we see ourselves. Interestingly, studies have shown that girls in an all girl educational environment are far more likely to choose STEM subjects, far more likely. And I don't believe that that's just down to the lack of boys. You know, I think that that's more down to the lack of a perception that this isn't going to be a subject that will interest you. Again, that deep ingrained societal gender bias that says girls aren't going to be interested in this kind of stuff. And that misconception is backed up by the evidence of there not being very many girls in the computer science or the science lab classrooms. So again, we're kind of checkmating ourselves and backing ourselves into a corner. So what can we do? Well, obviously we can't send everyone to girls' schools, especially not the boys, because that would be very inappropriate. Um, but there are some very simple things that we can do, and there's a growing body of evidence to prove that they really have a massive impact. First of all, just changing the decor in the environment can make it more attractive to, to females. Take down the Star Wars posters in the computer science lab and put up something more gender neutral like landscapes or nature. Um, also emphasizing the collaborative nature of the sciences can really attract more girls to study the subjects. But for me, perhaps one of the most important things that we can do right now at this period of our evolution is to make sure that we've got some really, really good role models for boys. Boys need to grow up from the very get-go knowing that discriminating against anybody for any reason is completely unacceptable, but to hold up gender as a way to measure somebody's worth or potential ability is just a normal topic. It, sh it shouldn't even be on the table. And boys need to grow up understanding that if they make it a topic, then they're just going to make themselves look stupid. It's actually the message behind a really good campaign that started a month and a half ago by the UN called the He For She campaign, which is looking at gender equality across the world and saying, do you know what, it doesn't just, responsibility for change doesn't just lie at the doorstep of the female of the species. It's all our problems and we all have a part to play in fixing it. Um, I want to share with you really quickly, just this, just, this is just one case study example of a, an education institution where they're making really good moves in this respect. So the Harvey Mudd College in California, 
40% of their computer science undergraduates are women. So how have they done it? Well, first of all, they made the introduction to, comp uh, to coding classes compulsory for every student. You. Um, to make it a bit more palatable, what they did was they rebranded the course. They changed the name of it from an introduction to coding using Java to creative approaches to problem solving in engineering and science using Python. Now, Python is a much more accessible language for beginners as well to learn. Having rebranded it and got people in the classrooms, what they then did was they split the class into two sections. In the gold section, they put all of the students who have absolutely no experience with coding. In the black class, all of the students who had a little bit or a lot of experience with coding. So without making it about gender, what they did was they split off those groups and the mostly male group who had a hand in coding already went and did their thing. And there was a much more inclusive and relaxed environment for the girls to begin to love science and technology. Then, killer move for this strategy, they introduced the girls to some awesome role models. And not just aspirational people like Lily Cole, but people working in industry, actually out there doing jobs in science and technology, so that these girls could identify with them and visualise where they might fit into the industry if they carried on studying. So what happened was they found as more and more girls signed up for the ongoing computer science course, the very act of there being more female students in the classroom attracted more female students to sign up for the courses. So it became this sort of self-fulfilling circle where it wasn't about gender, it was just about learning and a genuine love of a subject. So my manifesto for getting more girls interested in STEM, it's really kind of simple. Let's stop thinking about them as girls and start thinking about them as engineers scientists, technologists, mathematicians. And then, maybe, they'll start thinking about themselves that way too. Thank you. <laughs>